Okay. All right. So thank you for joining us today for the Louisiana Brownfields Conference Online Edition. My name is Rebecca Adi, and I'm the Brownfield Coordinator at the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. Um, so my job includes organizing workshops and events like this one to promote brownfield resources, supporting local brownfield coordinators and local communities that are interested in brownfield redevelopment, and facilitating brownfield projects throughout the state, you know, whatever that might entail. So uh, unfortunately this year, uh, we couldn't meet in person, uh, but we still wanted to get everyone together to share some of the content that we had planned for the Louisiana Brownfield Conference workshops. Uh, please note, this is our very first time hosting a webinar, so there might be some wrinkles and some kinks, uh, but I hope you'll give us a little grace and just kind of go with the flow. Uh, I think we're all kind of used to doing that at this point with uh, everyone coming up to speed on the new technology. So a few webinar logistics before we start. Uh, the webinars uh, are being recorded if everything works properly. Uh, and the PowerPoints will be available after the webinar when we post the recording. Uh, if you are listening in, please choose either your phone or your computer audio, not both. It just helps prevent uh, some feedback loops. Uh, if you have questions during the webinar, uh, please type it into the Q&A box. Uh, we'll stop at various places along the way to answer them. Uh, note that the chat box doesn't work for participants. Uh, this helps us keep track of the questions and make sure uh, that none of them gets lost. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we're going to open it up for questions. At that point, if you want to ask a verbal question, please raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, note, this is only going to be at the end. So if you raise your hand at the beginning, it's going to be up for the whole time. Might get a little tired. So you just want to wait till the end of the presentation uh, to go ahead and raise your hand. All right. Now that we have the logistics out of the way. Uh, I'd like to introduce Roger Jingles for our welcome. Roger is the LDEQ Assistant Secretary for the Office of Environmental Assessment. Uh, Roger, along with Dwayne Wilson, they were the pioneers of the Brownfield program at LDEQ and really built it up to what it is today. Um, we still, even though he's, he's a higher up now, we still pull him in from time to time because he, we know he loves this program so much. Um, so Roger, I'll turn it over to you for the welcome. Hello, uh, Rebecca described her job, my job in relation to Brownfields is to help Rebecca get and the Brownfields team get whatever they need to do their job well. And uh, we're hope we're doing that well. On behalf of our secretary, Chuck Carr Brown, the Louisiana DEQ wants to welcome you uh, to the 2020 Louisiana uh, Brownfields Conference online edition. Sorry, we couldn't do this in person. We will at a future date but I think our team has put together a really good webinar and you're gonna enjoy it. Uh, LDQ's programs, we work cooperatively together to facilitate the cleanup and reuse of Brownfield sites through the, throughout the state and, and the Brownfield team does, does work with several, cooperatively with several other programs here at, at the DEQ. Uh, specifically in this webinar, as Rebecca said, you're gonna hear about how LDEQ addresses asbestos through the Brownfields program. Rebecca has also reminded me to thank our partners, the Louisiana Brownfields Association, who has been a long partner with us, and the Louisiana Municipal Advisory and Technical Services Bureau for helping us get the word out on this. So thank you and welcome to the webinar. We hope you enjoy it. Great, thank you, Roger. Um, as he mentioned, we have a great team at LDEQ to help with addressing environmental concerns uh, at Brownfield redevelopment projects, including Jennifer Schatzel, the Brownfields and Voluntary Remediation Program Technical Liaison, who's going to be speaking today, uh, and Dwayne Wilson, who's our Brownfields advisor. Uh, I mentioned uh, he started DEQ's Brownfield program, and he has a wealth of institutional knowledge that we regularly draw from. He keeps trying to retire and we keep pulling him back in. Um, in addition, as Roger mentioned, we draw on experts from other LDEQ divisions to help facilitate the assessment and cleanup of brownfield sites. And you'll hear from Davina Witte today, one of those experts. Um, but first, let me introduce uh, Jennifer Schatzel. 
So Jennifer brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to DEQ's Brownfield program. After graduating with a degree in toxicology from the Uni University of Louisiana at Monroe, Jennifer worked as an environmental consultant for over 15 years, conducting and overseeing a variety of Brownfield and BRP projects, uh, including the Lincoln Theater in Baton Rouge, uh, the West Rigo City Hall site, and the Wallace Community Center in Raceland. After coming on board with LDEQ in 2018 as an environmental senior scientist, uh, uh, Jennifer transitioned to the role as the LDEQ Brownfield and VRP technical liaison in 2019, uh, where she provides technical assistance and oversight to state and local brownfield projects uh, and assists sites through the voluntary remediation program process. Uh, so her background in navigating EPA funding requirements, as well as her extensive knowledge in LDEQ's risk evaluation corrective action program and the VRP, uh, really makes her a critical resource for addressing environmental issues at vacant and abandoned properties uh, to get them back for use. And I have to say, in working with her in the past two years, let me tell you, she knows a lot. And what she doesn't know, she will find out. Um, Jennifer really has a great attitude and a passion for helping bring uh, these brownfield sites back to life uh, and the brownfield program is really lucky to have her and she's a wonderful resource to tap into for brownfield throughout the state. Uh, Davina Woody has been part of DEQ for 19 years uh, in a variety of capacities including water permitting and as an air inspector. Uh, she's been involved with DEQ's asbestos program for the past 12 years uh, and last October was promoted to environmental scientist senior for asbestos and lead. Um, I don't think she knew at the time that meant I'd be coercing her into these types of presentations, uh, but luckily she readily agreed, and I think you'll really benefit from her breadth of knowledge. Uh, when I asked her what she enjoyed most about her work, uh, she said helping people. Uh, and I found this to be true. A lot of the LDEQ folks, they're very passionate about their jobs and really do want to help you address environmental, environmental issues at your site uh, for a healthier environment for all. Um, so really, they're, they're great resources to tap into. Uh, in Davina's spare time, she also enjoys running, hiking, and traveling. And one of the accomplishments she's most proud of is running a marathon, which I got to admit, something I don't think I'm going to ever attempt. Um, so I'm really impressed by that. Um, and before I hand things over uh, uh, to Jennifer to start us off, I just want to go ahead and emphasize this is just really the start of the conversation. We're going to go over some technical information just to help you become more familiar with addressing asbestos at brownfield sites and to avoid some common mistakes that folks make. Um, we do not anticipate that you'll be experts by the end of this webinar or that you're going to retain every little bit of information. Uh, and if you're like me, uh, you're going to have a question right after we close the webinar. So just know we are here to help you throughout the process. So feel free to contact us afterwards if you have additional questions or six months from now where you can't remember the difference between friable and non-friable and why it matters. Um, just absorb as much information as you can today. Know we're here for you for the long haul. Uh, and with that, Jennifer, would you like to get us started? Sure. Uh, all right. Let me figure out the screen sharing. Oh, wait, sorry, I forgot. Also getting fancy you want here. To stop? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it back over. Okay. I forgot to do my polls. Uh, hold on just a second. Okay, we are getting very fancy with this one. Everyone's my guinea pigs for testing everything out. So we do have a poll before we start. Uh, it's going to come up on your screen. Uh, basically, just give our, our panelists some information on who they're talking to, um, how much experience you have addressing asbestos at Brownfields or at other sites, and where are you located. So we'll just give folks, you know, um, a couple of minutes to, to answer where they're located and what experience you have. Um, and then we will continue with the webinar. Great, a lot of people voting. Got a wide variety of folks. 
a lot of different experiences. That's great. All right, last chance, and then I'm going to go ahead and close it. All right, let's end the poll. And we're going to share the results. Okay, hopefully these are on your screen. So for um, how much experience do you have? It looks like we've got a good chunk spread all over. So 29% for some experience and no experience, 19% somewhere in the middle, 10% uh, that have a significant amount, and then 14% that says not a lot. So good smattering, that's great. Uh, and where are you located either normally or just today because everyone's telecommuting. Um, a lot of people in Southeast Louisiana, good number of people from some other states, so welcome. Wish we had gumbo for you. Uh, and some folks from the capital region and then a few folks everywhere else. So welcome. Okay, now I'm gonna stop the share results. And now Jennifer, I'm officially passing it over to you. Okay, you sure? Yes, I'm sure this time. All right. <laughs> All right. Are you able to, is everyone seeing the poll? Are you able to take, oh wait, I got it, Am I? Okay, <laughs> well, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm Jennifer Schatzel. I work with the LDQ Remediation Division. I work with Rebecca as the Brownfields Technical Liaison. So I work more on if you can help reviewing plans, navigating the regulations, or uh, you know any technical uh, help you may need. So, asbestos, the miracle fiber. So asbestos has been used throughout a good portion of human history. However, it's used in everyday materials. They really skyrocketed in the 20th century. Um, in the 1940s, Life Magazine dubbed it the magic material. And it was with good reason. Asbestos was durable, it was strong, flexible, it was inert non-flammable and a great insulator. But even better, it was an economical material. It was fairly cheap to mine and process and it was readily available. So it was able to be blended into materials to manufacture numerous products. As shown here is some, some retro ads for uh, asbestos. We have cement pipe, uh, floor tile, exterior wall panels, and roofing products. Unfortunately, um, with all these upsides of asbestos, the health-related downsides were eventually realized. Uh, specifically, inhalation of asbestos fibers were shown to be an issue. So in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, governmental agencies started regulating its usage to prevent this exposure. So how does this relate to brownfields? Well, a brownfield is a property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant, such as asbestos. Although it's now regulated with some specific uses, banned or restricted, asbestos can still be present in certain building materials and particularly in the older buildings, which we often encounter at brownfield sites. However, the potential presence of asbestos, it's not a death sentence for a redevelopment project. Uh, understanding the health effects and the regulations can really assist you with project planning. The first step is to uh, gain an understanding of the location and the quantity of asbestos that's present. This can be gathered by having an asbestos inspection conducted by a qualified inspector. Once it's identified proper management of the materials, whether it be proper removal and disposal, encapsulation, or the maintenance of existing materials, these can be incorporated into your redevelopment plan. So um, to give you a little bit more information about this, we have Davina with our asbestos division. 
here to help you and hopefully help you understand, better understand asbestos and how it could affect your project. So Davina, you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen? Yep. Okay, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so like uh, Jennifer said, I'm Davina Witte. I'm the environmental scientist senior with the LDEQ surveillance division. Um, my home base is in um, Southeast region. Um, that's in New Orleans, but I do work statewide and I travel to other regions um, every so often. Um, so I'm gonna start pretty basic and then we'll get more into depth as we go along. So um, Jennifer touched on this a little bit. Uh, what is asbestos? Um, it is a fibrous naturally occurring mineral that is mined um, from the earth. It can be found throughout the world and it is defined as any asbestos or any material or product which contains more than 1% asbestos. There are two groups. There's the serpentine and the amphibole. The difference is in their structure. The serpentine is a sheet or layered structure and the amphibole is chain-like or crystal structure. Types of um, serpentine, there's really only one and that's chrysotile. That's the white asbestos that most people are familiar with. Um, and then there's several types of amphibole. The most common of that type is amosite and chrysotile. So we've got the white, the brown, and the blue. That's what we mostly see when we're um, dealing with building materials. Um, this is the chrysotile. Like I said, it comes kind of in sheets and it is white. There's some pictures on the bottom of what it looks like under a microscope. And again, under the microscope. And these are some of the other amphibole types. Um, you can see down on the bottom, Left screen is chrysotile. That was the blue, and um, so these are the other types that we might come across. Okay, why do we care? Like Jennifer said, um, there are some health risks that we found out later after um, asbestos was widely used. Um, so studies and I can't say this word epidemiologic investigations have shown that inhalation of asbestos fibers may lead to increased risk of developing one or more diseases. There are different factors um, if you, to contract a disease, um, amount of exposure, um, individual's lifestyle, or the individual's susceptibility. The routes of entry are inhalation and ingestion. Um, and ingestion is really rare and there's not really significant issues with it, inhalation is really the, the bigger problem. Um, and with these, um, there's a latency period for 10 to 40 years. Um, the asbestos related diseases, there's three of them, asbestosis, lung cancer, and mesothelioma. Asbestosis is the fibrotic scarring of the lungs. You will get a fiber, inhale it, it'll get in your lungs and your lungs will um, start uh, making um, scar tissue. And that really reduces the capacity of the lung. The most common symptom is shortness of breath. The typical latency period is 15 to 30 years. Um, a latency period is the amount of time from the moment of exposure to the start of symptoms. So you can be exposed today and not see any symptoms for 15 to 30 years. Um, and it's a based on dose response relationship. Dose response relationship is um, the higher the dose, the more likely you are to get the asbestosis. Lung cancer um, is another one of the common diseases. Um, there are a lot of different causes of lung cancer. One of the biggest ones is um, from smoking. An estimated increased risk from smoking is 10 times. The estimated increased risk from asbestos is five times. But if you combine smoking with exposure to asbestos, you have an increased risk of over 50 times 
more likely to contract lung cancer than a non-smoker that does not work with asbestos. Typical latency period is 20 to 30 years. Mesothelioma, um, that's the one that we hear most about. However, it is the most rare. It is a cancer of the chest cavity lining. It can also occur in the lining of the abdominal cap cavity. Um, I think the reason we hear most about it is because it spreads rapidly and it is always fatal. Um, like I said, it's the rarest of the asbestos related diseases and it does not appear to have a dose response relationship or an increased risk for smokers. Uh, the typical latency period is 20 to 40 years. Um, why is asbestos used? Jennifer touched on this briefly as well. It was the miracle product. The, ex the long, thin fibers could be woven very easily. The high tensile strength, which means it, you can stretch it, bend it, and it won't break. Um, it's resistant to chemical and thermal degradation has a high electrical resistance, it's fire resistant, and it's a very good insulator. Um, EPA identifies three different categories of asbestos-containing asbestos building materials. That's surfacing material, that is um, material that is sprayed or troweled on surfaces for acoustical, decorative, or fireproofing purposes. Thermal system insulation, or TSI, it's an insulation used to inhibit heat transfer or prevent condensation on pipes, boilers, tanks, ducts, and various other components of hot or cold water systems and HVAC systems. Those two are usually very friable, and those are the ones we worry about the most. The third category is miscellaneous material, and that is anything that's not surface material or TSI. It's largely non-friable materials, such as floor tile, ceiling tile, roofing felt, concrete pipe, outdoor siding, fabrics, et cetera. Um, a lot of products with asbestos in it. Um, it was the miracle material. So um, it was used quite frequently. Here's just um, a few of the products and like the slide before is over 3000 products. It's, it's everywhere. So who is regulated? In DEQ, we regulate facilities. A facility is um, a long definition, but it's any institutional, commercial, public, industrial, or residential structure, installation, or building, any ship, and any active or inactive waste disposal, or asbestos contaminated debris site. Residential buildings that have four or fewer dwelling units are exempt except for those residential structures that are intentionally demolished or renovated as a part of a commercial or public project, such as an urban renewal or highway right-of-way project, or those that are intentionally burned. So to break that down, the types of facilities are um, institutional, commercial, public, industrial, residential having greater than four dwelling units, installations, ships, and asbestos contaminated debris sites. Um, most of those you recognize. Some of these um, I'm gonna go ahead and define for you to make it more um, understandable. An institutional facility is a facility operated by an organization having a governmental, educational, civic, or religious purpose, such as a school, hospital, prison, military installation, church, or other similar establishment. An installation is any building or structure or any groups of buildings or structures at a single demolition or renovation site that are part of a planned project that are under the control of the same owner or operator or owner or operator under common control. So even though I said before that residential properties are exempt, if they fall under an installation, then they are not exempt. Um, an ACD site is an asbestos contaminated debris site. It's a site containing demolition or renovation debris that contains regulated asbestos contaminated material. So who is not regulated? Again, it's the residential buildings that have four or fewer dwelling units, except those residential structures that are intentionally demolished or renovated as part of the commercial or public project urban renewal, highway right of way, that would make it the installation or those that are intentionally burned, such as firefighting practice, 
um, that would be an institutional building. So we have had instances where a city has burned down houses without um, removing asbestos or inspecting for asbestos for firefighting practices. And that became regulated because it's an institutional use. So, um, like I said, how would you keep residential properties from becoming regulated? Um, this happens quite often. We have cities or parishes that come in and want to do these projects. They want to know if they're regulated or not. Um, and if they're going to tear down a bunch of houses, then it would become an installation or a project unless you bid on it right. So to keep residential properties from becoming an installation, i.e. becoming regulated, you would need to request bids for a single house. If you request bids for a list of houses, that makes it a project, that makes it regulated. Or you can request bids based on square footage, floors, something like that, then issue a work order for demolition of each house, taking care not to issue work orders for houses that are close to each other, i.e. an installation. Um, close to each other, people have questions about that. Um, at the bottom, I put a little asterisk. The um, LDEQ LESHAP guidance on residential demolitions discusses the allowable proxim proximity. So you can take a look at that if you have any questions um, regarding what is close to each other. Okay, so what is regulated? Any demolition or renovation response action or asbestos contaminated debris activity that disturbs regulated asbestos containing material or rackum, if the combined amount of rackum to be stripped, removed, dislodged, cut, drilled, or similarly disturbed is at least 60 linear feet on pipes, 64 square feet on other facility components, or at least 27 cubic feet of facility components where a length or area could not be measured. And these are called our thresholds. So whether it's Rackham or not depends on friability. Friability is the ability for um, the material that when dry can be crumbled, pulverized, or reduced to powder by hand pressure. Um, examples would be TSI and surfacing material. So if they can be crumbled, pulverized, reduced to powder by hand pressure, that would release fibers into the air, and then we would breathe it. That's this kind of stuff that we want to regulate. So um, it's broken up, asbestos containing material is broken up into three categories when we're discussing, when talking about friability. Friable asbestos material, any material containing more than 1% asbestos that, when dry, can be crumbled, pulverized, or reduced to powder by hand pressure. Like I said, that's TSI and surfacing material, those types. Category one, non-friable, is asbestos containing packings, gaskets, resilient floor covering, and asphalt roofing products that contain one, more than 1%. That, when dry, cannot be crumbled, pulverized, or reduced to powder by hand pressure. Category two non-friable is everything excluding category one, but again, 1% and when dry cannot be crumbled, pulverized, or reduced to powder by hand pressure. So um, what is regulated then? So regulated is any friable asbestos material. Category one and two non-friable that has become friable. Category one and two non-friable that has a high probability of becoming or has become crumbled, pulverized, ground, sanded, cut, abraded, or reduced to powder by forces that have acted or are expected to act on the material in the course of a demolition or renovation operations. So it's not if it's just friable, if, it's, if it can become friable, then it is regulated or has a high probability of becoming friable. And then resilient floor covering or asbestos containing mastic, which is the glue used to attach it to the floor. If it is scraped, sanded, abraded, bead blasted, cut, ground, crumbled, pulverized, or reduced to powder by any means, either hand or mechanical equipment. Um, Note, 
The name of this um, comp, uh, webinar is an ounce of inspection is worth a pound of cleanup. If a facility is demolished or renovated prior to an inspection or notification, then all debris at the site is categorized as asbestos contaminated debris and shall be handled and disposed of as Rackham. So what we don't want to do is go demolish a building without having an, an inspection done. If we don't have an inspection done and we don't know if there is asbestos contaminant, um, containing building materials in it, we're just going to assume that there was and everything is now contaminated, everything is treated as regulated material and that gets very, very expensive. Um, also, if a facility is being demolished and it's structurally unsound and in danger of imminent collapse, and therefore it cannot be inspected, then it's the same deal. We're just gonna assume that there is asbestos and it will all be disposed, handled and disposed of as Rackham. Okay, so how do we know if ACM is a present? Like I said, we need to do an inspection. Regulated facilities must be inspected prior to demolition or renovation um, or response action. Um, an accredited inspector must thoroughly inspect the affected facility or part of the facility where the activity will occur for the presence of asbestos. Um, or you can just skip the inspection and assume that Rackham is present and treat all suspect material as regulated. So if you don't want to assume and we're going to do the inspection, the inspection must be made by an accredited asbestos inspector. For each area of the building, the inspector must visually inspect and identify suspected ACM, much touch all suspected ACM to determine friability. That way we know if it's regulated or will become re regulated within um, the activity. Identify all homogeneous areas of friable and non-friable suspected ACM. A homogeneous area is any area of surfacing material, TSI, or any material, miscellaneous, that is uniform in color and texture. Um, if you have all the same ceiling tile, you can call that homogeneous area and do your, um, take your samples from different places among the ce those ceiling tiles. If you have two different ce ceiling tiles, you have two homogeneous areas. If you have three, three homogeneous areas, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, where was I? Um, the samples must be analyzed for asbestos using an, an accredited laboratory. The amount of samples um, usually depends on your square footage and your homogeneous areas. Remember, an ounce of inspection is worth a pound of cleanup. Make sure you do your inspection before you start doing your work. So what do you need to know for a demo or a reno? If asbestos contained in material will be disturbed during the demolition, renovation, response action, or ACDA, notification must be provided by completing and submitting an AAC2 form to LDEQ Office of Environmental Services. You would submit an AAC2A form if the amount of Rackham to be removed is at or above those threshold limits that I explained earlier, and an asbestos disposable verification form or ADVF is required. An ADVF is a shipping document required for disposal of Rackham. Um, it's the cradle to grave. We wanna know where it started. We wanna know where it ended. So once you take it to the, uh, the landfill, we know that it actually made it there. Um, an AAC2B form is if you do not need an ADVF. An ADVF is for regulated material. If, so if it's not regulated, you do not um, need the ADVF. Um, so an AAC2B form is not required if ACM is not present in a facility to be demolished. We call that a negative declaration. If there is ACM present in the facility that is not and will not become regulated, or if there's ACM that will become regulated, but it will be below thresholds. Notification is submitted 
must be submitted for all demolitions, even if there's no ACM is present. Notification for renovations or response actions are not required if there is no ACM present. Um, all Rackham regulated material must be removed from a facility being demolished or renovated before any activity begins that would break up, dislodge, or similar, similarly disturb the material or preclude access to the material for subsequent removal. Rackham does not need to be removed before demolition if it is category one non friable ACM that is not in poor condition and has a low probability that it will become Rackham. This is when that friability um, assessment comes in. If it is on a facility component that is encased in concrete or other similarly hard material and is adequately wet whenever exposed during demolition, if it was not accessible for testing and therefore was not discovered until after demolition began and as a result of the demo, the material cannot be safely removed. If it's not removed for safety reason, the exposed rackum and any ACD, it's asbestos contain contaminated debris, shall be treated as um, asbestos containing waste material and adequately wet at all times until disposed of, or if it is category two non friable ACM and the probability is low that the materials will become regulated. If um, Rackham will be disturbed during the demo, reno, response action, or ACDA, you must hire the appropriate people to conduct the work. When you hire your demo contractor, they must um, conduct AC, uh, shall comply with all requirements of Louisiana State Licensing Board for contractors to perform asbestos abatement. So they need to be licensed with the state board to be able to um, perform asbestos abatement. That's an important one that people don't think about. Um, no demolition or renovation activity that disturbs Rackham or an asbestos contaminated debris activity shall be conducted unless at least one credited asbestos abatement contractor supervisor is physically present. All asbestos abatement workers who are performing the demo reno activity that disturbs Rackham or the ACDA shall be accredited and supervised by an accredited asbestos contractor supervisor. So what do you want to look for on the job site? Um, I've touched on some of these briefly. Um, an accredited asbestos contractor supervisor must be physically present during the activity. The asbestos contractor supervisor and workers directly involved in the demo Runner must have proof of accreditation. That's either a DEQ issued card or the accreditation certificate DEQ issued and a photo ID. The accreditation certificate alone is not acceptable because we don't know if you are who is on the, the certificate. Rackham and any ACD must be adequately wetted prior to and during the demo reno and during staging and loading. That is a dust emissions control so that we're not um, throwing fibers into the air for everyone to breathe. So um, at all times, Rackham must be adequately wet. Um, emission control methods must prevent visible emissions. Um, that can be the water um, or the work area controls such as containment, your neg air machines, um, all those kind of things. Um, Again, Rackham must be adequately wetted and contained in a leak tight, clear, transparent wrapping that can be individual bags or a lined dumpster. Generally, um, your TSI and surfacing materials, your friable materials are gonna go into individual bags. Um, a lined dumpster is used more for your non-friable stuff because they, again, they don't break easily and they're not gonna fit into these individual bags. Um, and they'll rip the bags um, because they don't break or crumble easily. Um, generator information labels and asbestos warning labels must be placed on the leak tight, clear, transparent wrapping. Generator information is so we know where it came from. The ADVF must be kept at the site during the demo reno. So that's the asbestos disposal verification form we talked about earlier. For facilities demolished where Rackham is not removed prior to demo, care must be taken to avoid crushing the ACM and ACM must be adequately wet at all times. 
um, we've seen too often where they have their heavy equipment roll right over the, the debris piles and that is easily going to cause these fibers to become airborne. Transportation and disposal. Asbestos containing waste material, that is ACWM, notice that is not just rackum. ACWM includes rackum and non-rackum. So although it's not regulated, it still has to be transported by an authorized solid waste transporter. Vehicles used in transporting the ACWM must be marked appropriately during loading and unloading. If ACWM is transported in an open body truck, a tarp must be used to cover the load when in motion. Rackham must be transported with the ADVF. The ADVF must stay with the waste at all times. Um, ACD, ACWM must be disposed of at a recognized asbestos landfill, an RAL. Rackham must be disposed of at a type one or type two authorized to accept Rackham. It cannot be disposed of at a type three, which is construction and demolition landfill. Non-Rackham can be disposed of at a type three landfill, but you must disclose that it is non-regulated ACM and um, call before you uh, try to deliver it because just because they are allowed to take it doesn't mean that they will. Some uh, C and D landfills still don't want to take asbestos at all. So before you waste all that time, make sure you call ahead and see that they will accept the um, material. Um, clean up in an ACD site. Um, I had I've had some questions about this. Um, there should be no debris left on site. So when we have these demo sites. Um, we often have to go out there and make sure that it's clean, all cleaned up. A general rule is to remove at least the top two inches of soil. If debris is still present, you continue removing layers of soil until no more um, construction debris is, or demolition debris is found. Um, so more on soil, um, DEQ regulates um, demolition and renovations, so something by human activity. However, in brownfield sites, um, you may find legacy, what they call legacy asbestos contamination from release that was already occurred. We don't deal with um, asbestos in soil as far as having a standard or, you know, doing um, analysis of soil or anything, but I know that is an issue for some of the property owners or whoever's trying to develop the property. Um, I'm not going to speak on it too much because again, we don't regulate it and I don't know that much about it, but there is this um, document called Sample This, Asbestos in Soil um, from um, EPA Region 4 that goes more into the, um, the soil testing and what to do with that. Okay, so in summary, uh, you must inspect or assume that there is, to see if there is asbestos or assume that there is asbestos. Again, an ounce of inspection is worth a pound of cleanup. You must have it inspected or treat it all as regulated. You must notify, you use an AC2 form you must remove all regulated material prior to doing the demo or reno, and you must use accredited um, asbestos contractor and workers for regulated material. To transport, whether it's regulated or not regulated, use an authorized solid waste transporter. To dispose of it, it must be disposed of as at a recognized asbestos landfill. Um, I included some of these fun pictures. Um, like I said before, don't uh, run heavy equipment over piles of debris. That's gonna, um, it could easily con cause non-friable to become friable. Um, and we don't want any, you know, dust emissions from that. There could be fibers and we're exposing everybody to those fibers. Um, this picture is a little bit harder to see, but again, I said that all must be wetted, adequately wetted 
that is the official term in the um, regulations adequately wet. Uh, um, there's an unmanned hose that's not even pointing at the pile. So this is something we have actually found. Um, it's really uh, inefficient use of that hose. Um, it should be manned and it should be thoroughly wet where they are doing the work. Um, also, this is probably hard to see too, but where that bucket, the scoop is, there you can see some visible emissions. Um, this is why I said that you can line a dumpster. When you do line a dumpster, we are looking for something called a burrito wrap. The burrito wrap, we take the, the poly at the foot of the bed and you flap that over, you pull over each side and then the, um, the flap at the head of the truck, you pull that towards the back to tape it and that's how you get your leak tight um, seal. So when you're going down the road, the wind doesn't, can't uh, make that not so leak tight. Um, this is also in a dumpster, it's over the crossbar. Um, when you have your um, burrito wrap in there, when you dump it, it needs to slide out in all in one piece so it stays leak tight. If it goes over a crossbar, it's obviously not leak tight. And when you get to the landfill to dispose of it, you're gonna have a real problem. And yes, this is actually something that we found. Um, that's the gener generator label that must go on every leak tight wrapping. There's your danger asbestos warning sign that also needs to go on every bag. Um, and then we we're talking about Brownfield site. This is a site that I actually worked. Um, we were notified that several buildings were demolished without removing the any asbestos or having an inspection. Um, so we went out and looked at it and it looks fine, like who would ever know, but as we walked the site, we started finding this. This is um, asbestos transite siting and it was everywhere. So after the fact, they had they got in trouble for demolishing the buildings without inspection or notification. And um, they had to go dig several layers of dirt from the, um, from the soil to get rid of all of this debris. And the debris and the soil is now considered regulated and that's very expensive to dispose of. Um, okay, so these are your regional contacts. Um, and then I am at the bottom, I am statewide, and I am the asbestos senior uh, technical advisor. I'm supposedly the expert, so you can always call me if you have any questions. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Davina. Um, I just had a few more uh, slides. Just let me see if I can share. So yeah, just uh, I just wanted to go over um, a few things that I've encountered during brownfield projects. So I know that we're kind of armed with this information. These are just some of the things that you may want to watch out for just to kind of help it go smoother. Um, as Davina talked about, typically the process is to be with the inspection. And, oops, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so anyway, you begin with the inspection and then uh, you can figure out your cleanup plan. So uh, first and foremost, you wanna use a qualified inspector uh, that has the Louisiana certification 
and they will conduct the inspection in accordance with the regulations, kind of as uh, Davida was talking about with the homogenous areas, grouping them together, taking a correct amount of samples. Um, next, you wanna make sure that your end product will be a report that includes the location, quantities, and condition, if it's poor, good, also whether it's friable, non-friable, of any positive or assumed positive ACM. Uh, this is important because this, this information is gonna be the basis for your cleanup planning and estimating and everything else for the project going forward. So something else I've encountered a few times, try to verify that all rooms and buildings are accessible prior to your inspection. I've had a few instances where, you know, an inspection, a building or a room is locked. We have to kind of go, we have to start hunting down a key and that takes time or even worse, the inspector has to come back at a later date and finish uh, up the inspection. Once again, this can mess up your schedule, can, you know, mess up, you know, cost a little bit more. So just check all that before. Also, you may want to be aware of hidden ACM. Oftentimes, these older buildings, you know, they've been re renovated over, updated over the years, and it's very common for carpet or non-ACM flooring to have been laid over the old ACM uh, vinyl floor tiles. So usually, inspectors know to look for that, you know, to, to get down in all the layers, but just be aware. So uh, cleanup planning. Um, once your inspection is done and you have a report identifying locations and quantities of asbestos, you're, you're ready to start uh, planning how it's going to impact your redevelopment. So just consider your plans and uh, looking at what ACM might be disturbed, might become regulated during the renovation process, and would need to be removed prior to beginning it. If it's a complicated project, you may need to work with an asbestos contractor or a planner to kind of help you with that. It's, I mean, it, it, typically it's just easy to remove it all and then you don't have to worry about it, but there may be budget or feasibility issues, which where you can't. So uh, another thing to consider if, if your site's in a high, prof if it's a high profile site or if you're in a residential area you may want to kind of notify the community before starting uh, any abatement. Um, kind of, as you see in this picture, the, uh, during the removal, the asbestos abatement contractors will wear, you know, uh, disposable suits and respirators and uh, the community, it's kind of better to let the community know what's going on rather than them seeing all this and jumping to their own conclusions. All right, so you've decided your ACM needs to be removed and you're ready to hire an abatement contractor. Um, and I know to be in touch on this, but once again, make sure that abatement contractor has a Louisiana contractor's license for asbestos abatement. Ask them for a copy of it. You can go to the Louisiana contractor's website and look them up to see what their disciplines are. Just check that. Uh, make sure that they are using certified asbestos workers and supervisors during the work. Once again, you can ask them to provide copy of the actual workers certifications. We also recommend um, hiring a third party for, uh, firm, someone separate from the abatement contractor to conduct clearance sampling. Uh, clearance sampling is just some air monitoring, special air monitoring done. It's after the abatement is complete, just to document that the cleanup of the asbestos was sufficient. Um, uh, one, one other thing, if you're using Brownfield or any other federal funding, Davis-Bacon Act requirements may apply. Uh, asbestos abatement is considered building construction under the Davis-Bacon Act. So there are wage determinations and specific language relating to this 
that you need to include in any bid docs and uh, contracts. Uh, so that's uh, all for my tips. Um, I was just gonna show you a few pictures just of uh, one example project that I've worked on recently involving a brownfield site with asbestos issues. This is the old federal courthouse in Lafayette, Louisiana. It was constructed in the late 1950s, so that's prime time to be using um, asbestos containing materials. So the, the redevelopment plans are to keep the existing building, but renovate it for residential and commercial and or commercial space. So once again, first thing that was done was the asbestos inspection. And we, it identified uh, the location and, and quantities of, the, of asbestos containing materials present. Some of these included you know, the normal flooring tile and mastic, uh, boiler and pipe insulation, some spray on texture sealing, and some transite panels. Uh, these, these are a couple of pictures actually from the inspection. Um, I guess the, the inspection, these little baggies are used to collect the samples. You're just kind of taking a little small sample of the material. It's not extremely intrusive or destructive. Uh, if, as you can see, the upper left-hand picture, that is a uh, transite panel that tested uh, positive, had 20% chrysotile fibers. The upper right uh, pegboard, that also tested positive had also about 20% chrysotile fibers. The lower left is a uh, gypsum board with a layer of plaster, thin layer of plaster wall over it. So there was a lot of layers to this. The, the actual gypsum board and then the finishing plaster were non-detect for um, asbestos. However, there was a covering over the gypsum board that was uh, positive had 3% chrysotile. So when you get into things like this, even though there's different layers, if just one layer is positive, you have to treat the whole wall like it's asbestos containing because you can't really separate that out. And then uh, the lower right hand picture, uh, actually that floor tile the floor tile was uh, negative for asbestos. However, you can kind of see the black stuff. That's the mastic, the, the glue that was used to put the tile to the subfloor. And that ended up being positive. It was about 4% chrysotile. So armed with the results of the asbestos inspection report, um, the, when it, the, uh, they went ahead and did the asbestos abatement, kind of tied it into, uh, they were kind of, you know, do an internal demolition anyway for the renovation of the project. So let's see, just a couple pictures. This is after the asbestos abatement. Um, you can see they've taken down the subfloors. If there was positive floor tiling and all traces of the mastic removed, uh, some areas of the walls, um, pretty much just left with bare bones to, to start their redevelopment. So that's it for me. Um, you know, if, you, if you have any questions now, let us know. But if you have any later, here's my contact information. So feel free to uh, give me a call or email. Thanks. All right, thank you, Jennifer and Davina. Uh, great presentation, really good information. Um, if you do have any questions, go ahead and type those into the Q&A. Uh, while we are waiting for the questions to come in, I am gonna try to share my screen again. Okay, hopefully you are seeing the LDEQ website. Uh, if you go underneath air and then scroll down, Underneath programs, I've selected asbestos. Um, at the top of the page, you will see this wonderful video by uh, Dwight Bradshaw. 
uh, who has been with the department for as long as I think anybody can remember. That also gives you an overview of asbestos. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see Louisiana asbestos accreditation list by discipline. So this is where you can kind of check and see uh, if people are, um, are accredited and when their accreditation expires, uh, just to make sure that they will still be accredited throughout your project or have plans to make sure that that um, comes up to date. So, uh, and as Jennifer mentioned, you know, we've dealt with this on, um, on brownfield sites before. Um, I've had one where uh, there was an extensive renovation and they had all the asbestos out. And then for whatever reason, the contractor decided to leave uh, one of the truckloads of asbestos on the site. So uh, DEQ happened to notice that. That was when I was, uh, before I came on to DEQ. Uh, and we had to work with the asbestos contractor to make sure that was delivered to the proper place. So those are some things uh, you need to watch for. Um, and one of the things for brownfields that we really look for is uh, that asbestos disposal verification form that Davina mentioned. Um, you know, it's really important to make sure that that is, um, that you have it in place, that they request it before they start the abatement, it stays with the load, and then at the end of the project that you get a copy of it uh, that's, you know, signed by everybody, including uh, the disposal facility where it ended up, um, and it's fully executed. All right. I don't have any other questions. I'm going to lower this. And then hopefully you are seeing the um, contact information for everybody. And I'm going to go ahead, start the video again. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and type those into the Q&A. Um, I think one of our other sessions, one of our other uh, grantees that we've seen, um, a lot of folks are now doing, using brownfield money for um, asbestos and lead abatements in residential houses. Uh, if you are going to redevelop those homes as affordable housing, uh, those can qualify for brownfield funding. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Make sure if you're, if you're going to go in that route, make sure to do your asbestos uh, inspections ahead of time and address that. As Davina mentioned, it's a lot easier to do the, the inspection ahead of time rather than uh, wait till the end and find out that you had some in a hidden room somewhere. So. All right, uh, someone was asking, just as a reminder, the slides will be available after the presentation. We'll also be posting the recording on LDEQ's YouTube video, and we'll send out the link to that as well. All right, let me just check and see. If you have a question, you can also raise your hand. Uh, and I can unmute you if that's a little bit easier for you to, uh, to ask it verbally. And Davina and Jennifer, do you have any tips for um, when people are hiring an asbestos contractor, some things that they should look for or questions that they should ask? Uh, other than their, their certifications, you know, something that might make them sound like they, they know what they're doing and they've followed the rules before. Any particular things that people should look for? Mm, references? <laughs> references. Um, I think most of the contractors have a, um, an AI number hmm. and they, you can look them up on EDMS and see their enforcement history. Oh, that's a good idea. So an AI number is a, is a LDEQ's agency interest number um, that we attach to projects and contractors uh, in order to um, kind of organize the information in our electronic data management system. Um, so that's a really good tip, you know, find out what their AI number is uh, and go into that database to see um, what, what their history is with DEQ. One other thing I wanted to make sure to note, um, you know, there are different ways for dealing with asbestos at brownfield sites. Uh, as Davina mentioned, um, if 
the material is not going to become friable during the redevelopment, you don't necessarily need to take it all out and dispose of it. Um, you can do uh, an asbestos uh, plan to make sure that it doesn't get disturbed in the future. Um, so that's something if, uh, can, that can help with costs. Um, and if you have questions on that, you know, we're happy to work with you and your environmental consultant to come up with a way uh, to make sure that whatever you do at the end is safe for human health and the environment, um, but also meets with your budget and your project goals. So, okay. Uh, uh, there was a question, is there a database or contact list of the certified contractors that can perform abatements available? That's on the, on the LDEQ website. That's the one I mentioned. It's underneath the air section and underneath the asbestos program. Um, and that list is kept up to date. Um, and then uh, we did have a question about certificates of participation for this webinar. I'm sorry, we're not that fancy yet. Um, hopefully we will be in the future. Uh, right now we're working on just getting through the, the webinar system. Uh, and if we do these again in the future, hopefully we'll actually have a, a certificate as well. All right. I don't see any other open questions. So I just wanted to uh, thank you all for joining us all today. Uh, I hope you join us again next week, same time um, for the uh, Opportunity Zone webinar. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, some uh, regional and some local folks on Opportunity Zone funding, um, how it's been working to help uh, support the redevelopment of brownfield sites should be a great presentation. And then in two weeks, we will have uh, another presentation by DEQ folks about addressing underground storage tanks at uh, brownfield sites. Um, underground storage tanks and asbestos were kind of the two hot topics when we were putting together the agenda for uh, the original in-person uh, brownfield conference workshops. Uh, so we wanted to make sure to get those covered at least in a webinar format. So hopefully you will join us for those. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, our contact information should be on the screen if you have any questions afterwards. Uh, and again, we'll be posting the recording soon and you'll get notification of that once it goes up. So thank you again for joining us.